we have a Linux base image, it's called Oracle base image, which is basically a CD that has a well installed and, and, and has a, you know, our instant messenger pre-configured and Thunderbird pre-configured, so you just type in your user ID and password for single sign-on and it sets up, sets up your Linux box. And we have one for Solaris and we have obviously one for Windows. And so technically, employees can pick any of these and we'll support it for desktops and laptops. Um, but that wasn't what Mark was really focused yeah. on. Um, most run Windows on the, on there, but you know, in my team, obviously, no one does. Um, and in the Solaris team, they run Solaris, right? So it's yeah. kind of what you want to use. On the server side, I think, I mean, there's there's obviously massive amounts of of Linux because you know, back in 2002, when we came out with our first sort of big Linux message. Yeah. You know, we did we, we did say internally we will move our servers to Linux, right? I mean that was the message back in two thousand and two. And so we did do that. And and so before we acquired Sun, literally everything was Linux except for I don't know, maybe five big systems where yeah. X eighty six hardware wasn't capable. And we had Spark hardware, like the M systems for yeah. running like a big ERP system or whatever it was. And so now that we have the two operating systems and the two architectures, um, you know, we didn't just go out and say, oh, we'll have to replace our stuff. I mean, yeah. it, that doesn't work. But now, of course, we kind of look at, well, we're, we're building out a new infrastructure, which of the two operating systems and which of the two architectures fits the best for that deployment, and then we'll pick. Yeah. Right, so we're, we're not Linux only now, and we're also not Solaris only. Yeah. But we have a massive install base on Linux because of so many years of being in, in, in that deployment mode. Makes sense. Um, and then, from a development perspective, um, what's the engineering relationship between you know the Solaris groups? I guess John Fowler and his guys and, and your guys. Is there any uh, sharing, as it were, of some of the development technologies, or is it really completely separate because of the nature of that code base and the it, fact that Linux is more open? It is separate. Um, we do talk a lot. Uh, but we don't share code. Yeah. Uh, for obvious reasons. Yeah. yeah. Right? Um, but I think there's a couple of things. One is um, the data. We sort of talk a lot in, in the sense that you know the database guys and the middleware guys now work with two groups, right? And they basically say, "Oh, it would be cool if the OS could do this or that." And so they tell both of us. Yeah. And then both of us go and implement something. And if if these things are APIs, then we would. You know, we talk to make sure that we have the same and that we don't do something vastly different. That might be implemented different in Solaris and in Linux, but it, at least from a database user, middleware user, we'll do the same thing. So in that sense, we, we talk. And then, you know, when we look at uh, virtualization and, and, and network virtualization and storage management and stuff, so anything that, that affects user interfaces and affects how the customer sees features, we, yeah. we do discuss a lot, right? So the Solaris team is not going to implement some model of network virtualization, and we're going to do something totally different. Then we come up with a management product that doesn't work, right? So yeah. we make sure that that stuff doesn't happen. Um, we don't. I mean, Case Splice is a good example, right? So Case Splice yeah. is Linux only right now, but we've we've told this to people that we're now looking at how we can provide that same level of service to Solaris customers. And so they're not taking our code, but we're yeah. having meetings where we explain how this stuff works, yeah. and they want to find Solaris to do that. So that's sort of the model. Um, and then on the virtualization side, because when I think of Solaris 10 and certainly 11, there's a high degree of isolation with, I guess, uh, containers and some other things. I know there's Linux containers, not quite the same level. Does Oracle VM run just straight on top of Solaris, or, or it's, it's something entirely different for that Oracle right? VM is like ESX. Yeah. It's a hypervisor. Um, so you, you, you install it bare metal, right? So you have a the Zen hyper, you Zen, yeah. right? So you have the Zen, hyper, Zen hypervisor, and then you can install. You have VM running on top of it, exactly like how VMware works. So if you use zones, then you would install likely install just Solaris on the machine, and then you create zones on top of it because yeah. you have one kernel. But what what tends to happen is, particularly on the Spark side. So let me take a step back. So if you run Solaris on on Spark architecture. You have a real hypervisor, yeah. which is L logical domains LDOM, yeah. and that's now called Oracle VM for Spark. Now that piece is also in my group, yeah. because we're doing unified virtualization. Yeah. 
And then on top of that, you can create domains, which is basically exactly the same as virtual machines, right? There's real virtualization. Each VM runs its own Solaris kernel, can run different versions. Then you have zones or containers, and that's part of Solaris itself. Yeah. And that runs on x86 and Spark. And with zones, you have one kernel and you have isolation, like you said. Yeah. Now, a lot of customers are using logical domains and put zones inside that piece. So they could say, I have four domains running, and in domain one, I have four zones. Yeah. Right. So they mix and match the two because they have different characteristics and different advantages and disadvantages. So one way to look at it could be, let's say you have a customer environment where you have a middle tier thing and a database thing, and you want to run five customers. So you could say, I create 10 VMs, yeah. or I create five, five VMs, and within each five VM, VMs, I have one zone for middleware, one zone for the database to isolate the, the applications, but I use the VM to isolate the customer. When I also think Solaris for better for us, I always think of uh, ZFS or ZFS, I guess. Uh, I'm Canadian, so we call Z. Uh, I, have, I know there was some work with ZFS and Open Solaris days moving back up and code some uh, FreeBSD and the others tried to use it. Is there any need for ZFS inside of Oracle Linux or is it a separate thing or, or that's no place? No, you know, that's so two parts to it. One is Chris started ButterFS way before the Sun acquisition. Right? Sure. And um, the reason he did that was because Linux needed a better file system, right? And I'm sure I've mentioned this to you before that my team does two splits itself into two areas. One is we, we look at making Linux better to run databases, middleware and stuff, um, and be focused on, on sort of feedback from those guys, like making TPC benchmarks run better and have Java schedule better and whatnot. Yeah. And then the other 50% is totally unrelated to Oracle products. And really say, if I run Linux, I need better um, debugging or I need better file systems and stuff like that, which have nothing to do with running the database because we don't need yet another file. Yeah. But Linux needs it. And, and so ButterFS was really a ext tree was not a current file system. It's stable, yeah. but you know, forget doing all these snapshots and, sure. and all that stuff. And so Chris basically started doing ButterFS to get Linux into sort of the modern age of file systems. And so when we acquired Sun, so you know, of course, ZFS is very popular and it's very good and it's feature rich. Um, one of the things ZFS did was merge the block layer and the file system layer, right? You can do zpools and ZFS runs inside it set a pool. And traditionally on Linux, you had device mapper, which managed yeah. storage pools, and you had file systems that you installed on top of, but they didn't communicate. So when Chris started doing ButterFS, he also merged the two layers. You don't need device mapper for ButterFS, you just say, here's 10 devices, yeah. and I create my file systems on it. And so because he had a, he had similar ideas in many ways, ZFS is a Solaris file system that was written by Solaris people for the Solaris OS. Porting that to Linux would mean making something written for this OS work here, which can be made to work and people have yeah. done it, but it's not optimal, right? Because they have different ways of handling buffers and, yeah. and there's multiple layers. And so there's now a compatibility layer that whoever, I think Sandia Labs or someone, I forgot who was playing with this okay. guy. But they basically have Linux, a, a glue layer to make the calls go so that ZFS plugs in. So it works, but you don't have an optimal file system. And since ButterFS was written by Linux people for Linux, yeah. it's native. And since the feature list is very similar, in some ways better, in some ways worse, yeah. why bother doing yet another file system? So we didn't really see the, the need for it. Yeah. So you just keep focusing on better. And, and then in terms of tools, again, because now you know you have that you know, former Solaris Sun Group, whatever. When I think Solaris, I think D-Trace. I know there are all kinds of interesting tools. Is there a D-Trace or better? I guess there are, but needs for for that type of super innovation, whether it's from you know your team or others, to pull that type of deep level pro pro uh, probes that people can find whatever they need. So we, yeah, so we have a. Not early port, a reasonably advanced port of D-Trace for Oracle Linux. Um, the kernel code is open source, but it's it's CVDL still. It's the Solaris. Yeah, the Cuddle. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, the community development license, whatever it is. Um, but it's it's out there on, on, on OSS, and so we've we've come a long way 
in, in porting D-Trace. You can literally take the Solaris D-Trace book and cut and paste the scripts around Linux. Okay. Um, the one thing that we haven't implemented yet is user space bro. So D-Trace has two pieces. One is you can instrument the kernel for tracing what goes on, and you have libraries so that you can write your own application that when you build it with D-Trace things that it yeah. can go and, and, and do that. Um, so we so that's still pending, um, but we've made a lot of progress with D-Trace. So we have the, the user space tools that are part of Oracle Linux and in the kernel code, yeah. which is CDL kernel module. It, right, when I yeah. talk to customers, the first thing, since I'm the Linux guy, you know, the first thing I tell customers is, look, we I'm here to present Linux, but you know, as a disclaimer, we're doing Solaris and Linux. Solaris team is hiring more people. I'm hiring more people. Yeah. We're making both better. We're not doing one or the other and stuff.